If it's Wednesday, battleground brawls in Georgia and Pennsylvania. As the candidates in two of the most important Senate contests fight for their political lives, facing challenges above and beyond the national political environment. Plus, Russia, arguably at its weakest point in the war, amid new warnings that Putin's forces are exhausted and increasingly desperate. Does it potentially push us to the brink of a nuclear confrontation? And inside the Cherokee Nation's historic campaign for a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives, as it pushes Congress to make good on a centuries-old treaty with the U.S. government. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd. So with less than a month until the midterm elections, what if I told you that suddenly control of the Senate may not be decided by any of these big national issues like the economy or abortion rights or President Biden's job rating or crime? Instead, the fate of control of the United States Senate could hinge on how two candidates in two very different races face two very unique and individual challenges. The first is Georgia Senate Republican nominee Herschel Walker who is facing accusations that he paid for an abortion for an ex-girlfriend in 2009, even as, his camp as he campaigns on his support for banning access to the procedure. Walker again adamantly denied all the accusations in an interview yesterday, calling his accuser, who happens to be the mother of one of his children, a liar. Did you ever have a conversation with this woman at any time about an abortion? No. Did you ever, to your knowledge, give money to pay for the cost of an abortion? No. Is she lying? Yes, she's lying. Yeah, she's lying. Are you saying a flat-out denial to any knowledge of an abortion? Or is it flat possible out denial, it happened no, and you don't flat remember? Flat-out denial, lie. Lie, lie, lie. But then, after that interview was taped, the Washington Post published another story on the allegations saying they had viewed an image of a check signed by Walker and sent to the accuser at the time in question. NBC News has not confirmed the story or reviewed the documentation ourselves. Despite the accusations, top Republicans are sticking by Walker. Georgia is a state they can't afford to lose if they want to flip the Senate. That brings us to the Senate race in Pennsylvania, which Democrats can't afford to lose if they want to hold the Senate, especially if they end up losing another seat around the country. Democrat John Fetterman is defending his campaign's decision to not release the, his medical records after he suffered a stroke in May that he says nearly killed him. The last the public has heard from his doctors was in a letter released at the time of his stroke. In Fetterman's first in-person sit-down interview since that stroke, my colleague, Dasha Burns, uh, he relied on live closed captioning to help him deal with auditory processing issues he still faces as a result of the incident. You've been called on by the Washington Post, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, the New York Times. There are a lot of folks asking for this, so why not release the records? Well, as I said, I, I feel like, you know, I've been very transparent to the point of what, what voters could do, make the decision on whether I'm, I'm fit to, to run or fit to serve. In what way do you think you've been transparent? As I said, I put out uh, an evaluation of my medical team, and I've been campaigning and going around everywhere all across Pennsylvania in front of thousands and thousands of people. And I think that's, they're able to make their own, uh, their decision. Fetterman plans on using a similar closed captioning system in the upcoming debate with Mehmet Oz, who has seized on Fetterman's health, painting him as unfit to serve. Here's how Fetterman responded to questions about his ability to do the job. I feel like I'm going to get better and better uh, every day. And by January, I'm going to be, you know, much better. And Dr. Oz is still going to be a fraud. <laughs> you, know, you know, Dr. Oz likes to make fun of me that I might miss a word. But, you know, he's missed, you know, two words. And that is a yes or no on the national abortion uh, ban. If you're going to be our next senator, you have to give the answer. Dasha Burns is in Pittsburgh following her interview with John Fetterman. Ellison Barber is in Atlanta, where she's been following the Herschel Walker campaign. So, Dasha, let me start with your interview. Um, and what we didn't get from John Fetterman was more access to his doctors or more access to his records. 
are they at all having a, a, any second thoughts about doing the full release? I mean, I, I remember this became an issue in 2008 with John McCain and his health. And I think he released a, a pile of medical records that were like 3,000 pages. But he put it all out there. Um, and it sort of stopped whatever questions there were. Have they thought about doing that? Yeah, Chuck, you heard him pretty clear there. He is, he believes that the campaign has been transparent, that it is enough to be out on stage in front of thousands of people to have released that letter uh, back on June 3rd. I asked him, well, what if some voters don't think that's enough? And he said, well, they can make that decision on election day. It's up to them uh, to decide when they cast their ballot. And look, as I've been out there talking to voters, you know, we've, we've been talking about this election for many, many months now, but some people are just starting to tune back into politics, right? And what I'm hearing from folks, especially those who are still undecided because they've just seen so much come at them uh, here in Pennsylvania. They've seen the ads from Republicans from Oz. They've seen the ads from Fetterman, and they're just not sure what to do, how they're going to wade through this, they're waiting for that debate on October right. 25th. They want to hear directly from these candidates. And I asked John Fetterman about that debate. Take a listen to what he told me. Are, are you committed to showing up on October 25th, no matter what, no matter what your opponent says or does? Well, yeah, of course I'm going to show up on the 25th. How has your prep for a moment like this changed from the primary, considering the auditory processing issues, some of the issues with speech, what has the prep been like? And are you confident going into that debate? It's, it's going to be basically the same kind of prepping as it would be for any debate, except I'm just going to make sure that we have captioning in included in all of it. You know, it's interesting, Chuck, in one of the editorials uh, from the New York Times calling on Fetterman to release his records, uh, the writer said that for, for politicians, releasing just some information can sometimes be more harmful than just releasing Correct. all of it because it perpetuates these questions, right? It perpetuates the theories. And so this is why we pressed so much in that interview. Um, but so far, they're not planning to release those records. Right. They feel like they've, they've put it all out there. Yeah. John McCain, they put everything out there, including the fact that he'd gotten an STD, I think, when he was uh, after Vietnam. I mean, he put it all out there for that very reason. You put in some then the question is, what else aren't you putting out? Very quickly, um, how are they going to make sure this campaign isn't about Betterman in the last three weeks and his health and about issues that they want to run on? It's a great question. I mean, perhaps releasing those medical records would help uh, with that. But at the end of the day, we're going to see, I anticipate, on the airwaves a lot more ads about uh, abortion, a lot more of uh, the sort of memes that we've seen from, from the Fetterman campaign mm -hmm. against his opponent, Oz. And we'll see what what ultimately impacts voters, what actually hits home for folks. All right. Well, from one uh, candidate issue down to another one in Georgia. Allison, let's talk about uh, the Herschel Walker campaign and sort of what they're, how they're trying to do this damage control. They clearly believe they have, that he's got to be out there denying this straight up. This seems to be awfully risky. There's a lot of solid reporting that keeps coming on with receipts, and he keeps coming out there with full denials. Um, they still comfortable standing by their denial? Say someone asked me earlier this morning what was my biggest takeaway, if you will, from the sit-down interview with Herschel Walker last night that aired on ABC. And a lot of it was things that we have already heard, right? Since this allegation initially came out in reporting by the Daily Beast, you had Herschel Walker immediately come out saying that this was a lie. This was kind of the clearest, uh, most definitive, aggressive, if you will, denial that we have heard from Herschel Walker, where he really left little to no room for his answer from this is a lie to change. There's kind of no gray area here. He went through a list of saying not only did he deny these accusations, he repeatedly said the woman, uh, the mother of one of his children is lying. He said that repeatedly. And then he also, when he was asked if there was any sort of possibility that issues he'd previously had with um, his mental health, uh, issues he's had in the past of memory lapses, he says, when he has been dealing with uh, his mental health struggles, if maybe uh, 
something like that could be at play here. And he said, absolutely not. None of that's at play here. This did not happen. This is all a lie. But then on the heels of that, you have this new reporting from the Washington Post coming out where they say they have seen this $700 check from Herschel Walker that was allegedly given to this woman days after she had this procedure and also other documents. And that is the third news outlet to report details about uh, these documents. So, yeah, I mean, this story isn't going away. It continues to dominate the headlines here. Herschel Walker, for his part, he's not backing down in his denials. And national Republicans absolutely seem to be standing by him, even though you have some right. state politicians like the lieutenant governor now sort of right. letting off the gas, if you, know, you will. Chuck. Allison, the, he didn't commit a crime on the whatever the abortion situation is, whether he paid for it or not. No crime was committed there. He held a, he, there's been accusations that he held a gun to the head of two different women. How does he deal with that allegation? Yeah, you know, that's one thing that I'm going to be very interested to see how or if it gets addressed on the debate stage in Savannah on Friday. Because one thing that you will hear Herschel Walker's campaign say publicly and in private conversations when you ask about some of those uh, previous allegations of violence, they say he's addressed that, that had to do with his mental health issues, disassociative identity. He wrote an mm -hmm. entire book about it. Go read the book. He's addressed it. I read that entire book. In terms of the specific allegations with uh, his ex-wife, Cindy, who said in an interview that he was by her side for that she that he held a gun to her hand her head and said I'm going to blow your brains out that's not addressed in the book at all does he mm -hmm. talk about his mental health issues other instances of violence things like that yes but this really big specific yep. allegation of domestic violence that stuff hasn't been really addressed head on he had an op-ed in the a Wall Street Journal at some point where he sort of started to touch on it but there are still a lot of unanswered yeah. questions there and I think heading into this debate I'm curious if Senator Raphael Warnock will bring it mm -hmm. up because his campaign has sort of stayed away from a lot of that stuff or uh, if some of the moderators will address it yeah look I I, I, I understand the abortion story is the sort of shiny metal object of the last week mm -hmm. I felt that the other allegations you know that that borders on actual law breaking and things like that so it, it should be fascinating there Dasha Burns uh, Ellison Barber thank you both for getting us started so joining me now we're gonna take a look at the larger issue here of the balance of power in the Senate and how these two individual states and what happens to those races could actually have a lot of impact there. Jessica, you're back by popular demand when we did this before. <laughs> so here we are. We've got it narrowed down to uh, 11. And you know what was interesting here? I went through the 11. I thought, okay, I want to get through the ones that I know you're going to be comfortable moving first. And I only had three in my head. So Colorado, I assume, Democrats. despite what Republicans have done, they seem to have not gotten where they needed yes. to go there. Uh, and then the next one where I was feeling comfortable that I thought you'd be ready to move uh, is Arizona. Are you ready to put that? You moved that to lean Democrat moved before. To lean Democratic, that's correct. You know, and now, the other one is New Hampshire that and we New have to lean Democratic. Uh, you put that there. So, so let's go ahead and give that. So now mm -hmm. the Democrats need two. Mm -hmm. So let's move it there. They're looking for 50. Uh, they're behind in Florida. They're dead even in Ohio, yeah. but it feels like they're behind if they're even. Yeah. Uh, you got Georgia, you got Pennsylvania, where polls show they're, they're ahead in both. Mm -hmm. North Carolina feels like it's a dead heat. Utah is here for a different reason. We're going to talk about that in a minute. There's Nevada and Wisconsin. Let's go with Nevada first. This feels, is this the closest race in the country right now? I really think it is. It's sort of a, you know, Nevada's unique. Yeah. And it's a heavily transient state, new voters, but we've also seen a lot of new unaffiliated voters that are yeah. leaving Democratic voter roles. And also, Catherine Cortez Masto, she's not sort of as well known as other figures. But Adam Laxalt, the former attorney general that's running, his grandfather was senator and governor. His yeah father we learned later on was senator pete domenici yeah. um but he's not been uh, problematic in the ways that herschel walker or dr oz or jd vance have been yeah. he's sort of a generic republican and you know gas prices are still incredibly high in nevada the economy yeah. is still struggling I, that is by far republicans best pickup opportunity i was just going to say so for now if you had to move this today where would you move it or would you keep it frankly in our unassigned category it's sort of like on the edge there, yeah. but for our, for our addition purposes, we can always move it to Republicans if you need to. I don't, but, I, you know, I'm going to put it there for now, because yeah. I, but I'm with you. Everything here, I'm uncomfortable moving super fast. But the next one, I guess I Florida, would put down is absolutely. Florida. Rubio can't shake her, mm -hmm. but it's the path 
how does she take the lead, right? It's just a state where we've seen, you know, Trump improved his margins in Florida from 2016 to 2020. Yeah. I think a Democrat can get to 47, but those last three points there are just Herculean. It, what's interesting is I have talked to some Republicans nervous about what's going down in Fort Myers, nervous about mm -hmm. turnout down there. It's a lot of Republican vote. And in a two-point race, that matters. Yeah, I've talked to Democrats that they're like, you know, this is obviously a horrible thing that happened. Correct. But... <laughs> when you're looking at what the turnout looks like, absolutely. All right, so let's go to these last six here. Let's go to Georgia. Um, because of the runoff situation, mm -hmm. if, you, if, it, if we didn't have a runoff and 49 were a winning number, would you put this automatically, would you be like, oh, Democrats are going to win this if there wasn't a runoff situation? I mean, I still think it's a very close race. It's within the margin of error, but yeah. I see Warnock as far more likely to be ahead on Election Day um, than than uh, Walker is. And, you know, I can see a scenario where Warnock gets to 50 on Election Day. I can't see that for Walker. So even Repu both party strategists I've talked to think this goes to a runoff. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Democrats feel like we have to win this one. Is Walker ever a favorite even in the runoff? It's unlikely, is he? I think it's just still very, very close. Yeah. I mean, turn it comes down to turnout and how these things get out. I mean, we do have this coming... It's no longer a January runoff, it's a December 6th runoff, a shorter time yeah. scenario. My question is, is this the, the deciding state in the Senate, though? Right. And we see sort of a deja vu, all resources get poured into there. Are we going to have, you know, you're not Trump saying that the election yeah. was stolen, but you could right. be saying other states were stolen and and other, other candidates not conceding. I mean, we could see a little bit of a rehash of that. I'm going to go to Wisconsin next because we got some new polling out mm -hmm. today from Marquette. I'm going to discuss it earlier. Has Ron Johnson now up six? This is a poll two months ago that had Mandela Barnes mm -hmm. up seven. Now, their likely voter model has him up six. Mm -hmm. Among all registered voters, it's dead even. Where do you see the race? I think it's one that I would put a pinky on the scale for Johnson at this point. You know, right, we are we'll evaluating our now. ratings this week. We should, we'll have a couple of moves, I think, this, this Friday and next week, so to watch. But that's one where certainly the polling trend mm -hmm. has moved toward Johnson. Um, in polls, in fact, that underestimated him in 2016 when it looked mm -hmm. like he was suddenly going to lose, and he did not. Um, and, again, Democrats are just very skeptical. They really feel like these attacks on Barnes have taken on a life. It does feel like they have, and it feels like Barnes mm -hmm. just didn't inoculate himself the way other, we saw other candidates do it. All right, I, this is where I struggle. First of all, I want to, the Utah situation. What's interesting about Utah is it, the math, if, if Evan McMullen has said he's not going to caucus with either state. Yeah. So it means this doesn't matter to our math, does it? In a way, but I guess I still remain skeptical of that. Do because you? I think you get here to Washington. I mean, he has, he's. You think he'll pick a side? I, I again. And you think he, he picks that side, don't you? I'm not sure. Interesting. He has a lot of Democratic consultants working for him. So, so you, so what do you do with that race? Where do you put it? We have an unlikely Republican at this point, but like the races, because I still think Lee is a slight favorite. But it's one that, man, it's just hard to handicap this year because you do have. It's not like the Al Gross situation yeah. um, last cycle where he was Al running Gross as an Alaska. independent, yeah. but said he would caucus with Democrats. All right. So now we're down to our last four. Georgia, we're keeping there because of mm -hmm. the runoff. North Carolina. It's just a state that just hasn't moved yet. Yeah. I know everybody thinks it'll tip Republican at the end. Are, it, are they right? It's the most under-the-radar state. And, again, you look at histor historically where they've struggled with Senate seats, particularly yeah. back to 2008. And when you look at what the environment should be this year, I, I still think it tilts slightly to Republicans. But right. it's another one we're watching in our ratings, certainly. So, so look where we got. We got the Republicans sitting at 49. You got the Democrats at 48. So basically what we're saying is they got to win two of these three. In this scenario, we're not, if, we're, if, we're, if we're assuming they lose Nevada, look what that does with our Georgia and Pennsylvania stories. Yeah, I mean, I think Ohio goes to Republicans, too, eventually. I, mean, I know everybody um, says that eventually, but isn't this a case where Ryan, you know, Ryan's at 48? And, I, and it's not a winning number? It's an R, it could be, but it, it's an R plus 8 state still. I just have a really hard time. And the polls, again, showed that Biden and Democrats were being competitive there. I guess a lot of us have been burned by the polls, too, after the past few, few years. Right. So, look, I, I'm going to put my pick in the scale here. I think Walker is unelectable. I just think he's crossed the Rubicon. Maybe I'm wrong because it gets us to where I think we may be looking at. Is Pennsylvania the pivot state now? It very well could be. Well, there you go. Jessica Taylor. I mean, I see a 51-49 margin either way, perhaps, mm -hmm. or 50-50. Spent all this money, we still end up back at 50-50. It would be somewhat ironic. It would be, and it would mean neither party would believe they lost. Mm -hmm. They would have just assumed they came up a day short. Yep. All right, Jessica Taylor, as always, fine work at our...
friends at the Cook Political Report. Now we're going to turn to quick breaking news out of Connecticut, where a jury just ordered the conspiracy theorist Alex Jones to pay at least $965 million, yes, just under a billion, to the people who suffered from his false claims that the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting was a hoax. Today's verdict comes two months after a Texas jury awarded nearly $50 million to the parents of another child killed in the 2012 attack. Ben Collins uh, is our reporter on this Alex Jones trial. And Ben, he makes, I think people probably don't realize how wealthy Alex Jones is from the whole supplemental business and all of this stuff. Obviously, this verdict is designed to bankrupt him permanently. Will it? Maybe. Um, Chuck, this is considerably larger than anything I think even people in that courtroom thought. There are people breaking down crying at the even even the idea that uh, individually each of these families was going to receive you know 20 or 30 or 40 million dollars a piece in this verdict um, the issue of course here with Alex is that he will in fact uh, lawyer this to death maybe literally he might appeal this for the rest of his life this is a thing that he is fully committed to fighting against he gave up on a real legal strategy a ways back and uh, he's been trying to use these trials to sell supplements basically um, but I don't know how many, sub you can't sell a billion dollars worth of supplements, Chuck. Mm -hmm. Chuck, I don't know who can. Uh, you would be the greatest salesman on earth. And he's pretty good at selling lies, but he, I don't think he can be this good. How long can he tie this up, though, Ben? Is there a point where the system will say, you're, you know, you're out of appeals, sorry? Yeah, there, I mean, there will be a point where that happens, absolutely. Um, this, this is an interesting case because even the plaintiffs were not asking for this much. They were asking for about half this. Mm -hmm. um, so it is, it is double the previous one. He was, you know, he was ordered to pay $50 million in damages in Texas. That's going to be capped to about $5 million. He's assuming, mm -hmm. he's hoping that these caps uh, will also somehow affect the Connecticut trial. It doesn't really appear that there's any mechanism for that, but that's what he's hoping for. Um, but he, by the way, he said right after this, I was watching the live stream as it was happening, he was talking over the verdict as he's wont to do, and he said he's not going to stop. They're trying to make you not question mass shootings, is what he said, about Uvalde right. and Parkland. Uh, so he might just double down on this uh, until the end of days. How do they, how does, you know, are, are these internet companies going to just continue to give him access to the airwaves? I mean, is there a point, like... You know, how much money does he have to be fined? How much mu mu ver verdicts uh, does he have? To, how many verdicts does he have to lose before he should be prevented from spouting off? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing stopping him. He's created his own uh, world, right? He has a, a website that is branded as banned video uh, mm -hmm. that hosts all of these uh, files because he can't really stay on YouTube. He still tries to put stuff up there, but it doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. Twitter is, it, uh, he's been off Twitter for a very long time. There's, there's uh, no access to, for him there. So in terms of like individual, individual social media companies, he's not allowed on any of these places. He's got his own little empire there. Um, but keeping that up, right? Keep it just paying mm -hmm. for the server fees, right? Uh, that's going to be hard to do if you have to pay out a billion dollars yeah. uh, to these families over the course of the next few years. Ben Collins, uh, who's been on this beat uh, for quite some time. Ben, thank you for your reporting. Coming up, winning at all costs. Republican leaders who have spoken out against lies about the 2020 election are now campaigning with election deniers in Arizona. Senator Mike Lee is pleading fellow U with fellow Utah Senator Mitt Romney to please endorse him, help him. And he did it in prime time on Tucker Carlson. Does he really want Mitt Romney's help? It's a weird place to ask for it. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. It's not just Georgia where Republicans are sticking by a flawed or embattled candidate. In Arizona, Governor Doug Ducey and former Vice President Mike Pence, both of whom have spoken out against former President Trump's lies about the 2020 election. Well, they hit the campaign trail for two election deniers in Arizona, gubernatorial candidate Kerry Lake and Senate candidate Blake Masters. Vaughn Hilliard pressed Ducey on why he and the Republican Governors Association were backing Lake to be Arizona's chief executive. Take a listen to the exchange. How are you squaring up the known threat that election denialism plays at the state level here with RGA's support of Kerry Lake? In Arizona, border security is an incredibly important issue, along with school choice, along with lower taxes. 
Kerry Lake is on the right side of all three of those issues. So that's going to give you pause, knowing that the threat that uh, denying and not certifying an election would pose. You stood there against the pressure and did not back down. I, Kerry Lake has said that she would decertify the 2020 election. The primary's over. I have every confidence that our elections will maintain their integrity going forward. Let me go to Vaughn Hilliard really quick. He's on the ground force in Phoenix, where early voting, by the way, began today. Look, Vaughn, you're, a, you're, you, you're an Arizona native. You've covered the state very thoroughly for us. Governor Ducey, it's a, it's, he's a, not the easiest guy to get to talk on the record. Uh, you got him on this. He seemed uncomfortable uh, with your questions. He seemed uncomfortable supporting Carrie Lake. Right. I mean, those are his first on-camera remarks about his support of Carrie Lake. It was implicit through the RGA, which he chairs, which was funneling millions of dollars to boost the candidacy of Kerry Lake. But largely those ads had been more so targeting the Democratic opponent, Katie Hobbs, and taking issue with her candidacy. But the, you just laid it out there, Doug Ducey uh, tacitly uh, backing Kerry Lake's candidacy here. And I think this is the real issue that when we're looking at this governor's race here, which we expect to remain competitive in these final weeks, is how many of those more independents, those mm -hmm. conservative types that may be the likes of Doug Ducey would have been uh, cautious to support, and most folks would have expected him to be cautiously supportive of, how many of them ultimately get behind Kerry Lake's candidacy, and in so many ways, Doug Ducey represents, uh, if in the fact Kerry Lake yeah. were to pull off this win, uh, a, a, a marked note about those types of voters that ultimately got behind her, despite no. her election denialism and other uh, uh, propagation of conspiracy theories. Look, his answer to you, when he says Kerry Lake's on the right side of those issues, I could see that being clipped for an ad. And suddenly it looks like Doug Ducey supports Kerry Lake. Um, it might be enough there anyway. Vaughn Hilliard on the ground for us, where early voting begins today in Arizona. Vaughn, thank you. Joining me now on set, Nicholas Wu, congressional reporter for Politico. Stephanie Shriak, senior advisor for Strategic Victory Fund and the former president of Emily's List. And Stephen Hayes, the editor and CEO of The Dispatch, as well as an NBC News contributor. Let me give you guys a uh, quote here from Mitch McConnell. He did a uh, off-camera, on-the-record interview with our friends at... Uh, uh, Manu Raju over at CNN, and he said this about the Republican candidates, Nicholas. I don't have a litmus test. I'm for people that get the Republican nomination and for winning, because if we win, we get to decide what the agenda is, and they don't. Win at all costs. Ends justify the means. Here we are. We're all worried about this. Mitch McConnell's embracing this strategy. Is this dangerous? Well, at this point in the game, Republicans have to go all in on their candidates if they want any chance of taking the majority, which at the end of the day is Leader McConnell's goal. He wants to become majority leader again. And if it's with candidates that you know might have their flaws, like Herschel Walker or J.D. Vance in Ohio, uh, for McConnell, at the end of the day, those are people that will be one more vote in his column. Steve, I just, and I know that we got rid of the moral compass apparently a long time ago, and we threw it away. But really? I mean, you know... There's not a person in this town that thinks Herschel Walker is qualified to be a United States senator yeah. or has the character to do this. And here we are. Let me actually let me show you something before we get there. Here's Tom Cotton who wants to be president of the United States campaigning with Herschel Walker. Take a listen. All right. Uh, apparently we are having a hard time. And he said this when asked about his support. He said. Um, Raphael Warnock and the Dem Democrats want to make this about Herschel Walker's past. Walker wants to make this about Georgia's tomorrow. Just total forgiveness. Is that, yeah. is that we, presidential material? Look, this, this is what you hear from Republicans all the time to rationalize what they're doing in some cases. I mean, I can't imagine being in a position where, as a conservative or somebody who believes in the truth, you would could, could justify backing an election denier. And... Like, we've seen what the dangers are. This is no longer theoretical. I mean, look at what happened on January 6th. We've seen what happens when you go along to get along. Um, you know, is this reflective of the new Republican Party? I think there are very few Republicans who are willing to stand up and say, I'm not going to do this anymore. And the ones who are willing to say that are no longer, in many cases, Republicans. No, they leave. Yeah. Or they walk away. Or they're, or they're, or they're voted out. Or, or, right. or they try to become president of the University of Florida. <laughs> Stephanie? It's, I mean, it is... It's so disappointing, and we've been working in and around politics for, um, I dare say, many decades at this point, and it's just gotten so, so bad. And mm -hmm. you listen to Mitch McConnell and what he's talking about. He's talking about building a 
caucus that he is not going to be able to control very well, that's going to pass an abortion ban, that has a whole slew of election deniers who Lord knows what they're going to do in moving any kind of or stopping any kind of legislation on, on voting rights. In fact, they could roll things back that we don't even know what they might roll back. Yeah. This is a very, very dangerous time. And that's not including some of the just race baiting that we're want, like, is just outright open at these rallies. Mm-hmm. And no one's calling them out uh, the in the party. Not, thing. Exactly. I, I just. It's shocking. I, I, it's doubly shocking because of what he did for a living. He was the leader of many African-American men at Auburn and at, at, and at Cincinnati. I mean, there's a lot of moms and dads that are wondering that why they gave their son uh, uh, that, that advice to go uh, and take advice from that coach. Nicholas, let's move to Pennsylvania. You saw a little uh, scenario there. It's amazing that here we go again. This whole thing could come down to Pennsylvania. And John Fetterman looks like this is, this is an issue he hasn't fully resolved. Yeah, I mean, this is this is something where you know we, we're renting the final final months of the campaign, and and both sides are figuring out how exactly they're going to compromise on both of their nominees. Right, uh, Mehmet Oz is someone who has uh, many of his flaws, but we've seen Republicans coalesce on him. And Fetterman is someone who you know some Democrats certainly have expressed some misgivings about, but mm-hmm. at the end of the day, he's still their nominee. You can't really replace him at this point, and. Uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it still is worth remembering that, you know, he's still on the men from his stroke. And right. so we'll have to see. There's, they still have one debate um, left, I believe. And, uh, you know, if, if his performance is anything like that, yeah. you know, this could cause some issues. Stephanie, you've been in these situations and you have candidates that have some issues that, you know, it seems like they're whole, just throw it all out there. I mean, I go back. Steve, you remember the John McCain medical records? You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. he put them all out there almost to overwhelm, overwhelm people. Then there's no more questions. You know, I mean, this is a very personal decision, right? This is your, your health. Uh, he's a relatively young guy who is mending rapidly. Uh, I mean, I was actually talking earlier, and I'll be honest, I had a stroke three years ago myself, mm-hmm. and it takes a little bit of time. I am amazed at how well he's doing. I think he's fantastic, and he's going to get better and better. But ultimately, the Democrats are coalesced. The Republicans are coalesced. This is this is going to be about the persuadables mm-hmm. in those collar counties, as it always is. And we've got Oz, who has read the memo to not ever say anything about abortion now. So yeah. there you go. Uh, and you've got Fetterman, who actually does reach out to yeah. some folks in the middle of the state that we sometimes don't reach out to. So I think we've got a, a really good opportunity still here. It's just it's Pennsylvania. It was going to get tight. You know, it's interesting, Steve. So. Fetterman may need the coattails of Shapiro, right? And Walker may need the coattails of Kemp. I mean, the two governors' races could end up deciding the control of the Senate. Yeah, I mean, look, if you talk to Republican consultants uh, who are involved with or um, following Georgia very closely, that's what they're banking on. Yeah. Herschel Walker will become a senator because Brian Kemp is going to win by yeah. eight points, ten points. Figure it out, and that's. I mean, that's a. The bank shot strategy is sort of the yeah. last the last refuge uh, yeah. uh, of a party yeah. in trouble. I don't believe that's going to happen in Georgia. All right. <laughs> the Senate race that's always been the most intriguing to me all year, and it's like, is it going to be relevant? Is it not? And I'm not sure how much Evan McMullen is a threat to Mike Lee. I haven't been sure until I saw this last night. Here's Mike Lee with Tucker Carlson. Here's the deal. Yeah, I don't think Mitt Romney wants Chuck Schumer to continue to be the Senate Majority Leader. If I'm right on that, then he's get on board, because that's exactly what he will be producing. That's exactly what this will lead to. If Utah gets tricked into uh, electing Evan McMullen, a closeted Democrat, into the United States Senate. And so as soon as Mitt Romney is ready to, I will eagerly accept his endorsement. Wow. Uh, Steve, here's what this tells me. Uh, he's petrified that Evan McMullen is going to beat him because Evan McMullen has pledged not to caucus with either party. So it would technically make his math irrelevant this cycle because the Democrats would have the tiebreaker with 50-50. Um, he's, that seemed like, I wasn't sure how nervous Lee was. Now I think he's super nervous. Yeah, it makes, it makes his math irrelevant, but he's right that it and would lead to Chuck Schumer. It doesn't necessarily, by the way. But why not? Because it's only one seat. It's either 50-50 or and 50-50 Democrats win, or it's 50-49 and he sits there. Or it's, yeah. you know, it, no matter what, that, in Fair. this scenario, the math doesn't matter for this race. I mean, you did not tell me we were going to be doing math I live. I mean, this is like, I, I got into journalism to get away I'm from math. I'm aware of this. So, I'm aware of this. Um, yeah, look, I, 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 I'm surprised by 
that as well. Um, <laughs> it would, I, nobody would have predicted this a month ago. If we would have right. had this conversation with this group of people, we would have never said Mike Lee would go on Fox News and say... Absolutely. You know, please, Mitt Romney. Please, please, please Mitt, jump on. <laughs> Nicholas, of all places to go woo Mitt Romney, do you think using Tucker Carlson as your I mean, actually sounds like he just wants Mitt Romney to be harassed. Yeah, I mean, look at that Chiron, right? It was dirty trickster Pierre Derelicto, which is, you know, really kind of a deep cut on Mitt Romney. You have to know that's You really got to know your... Right. You got to know your... <laughs> you have to know this is, you know, Mitt Romney's burner Twitter account, right? <laughs> but, you know, in... in Mike Lee's always been kind of an iconoclast in the Senate, right? And that hasn't necessarily made him a lot of friends. And so, you know, we see McMullen's kind of banking on, uh, you know, Utah voters looking for something a little different. But, you know, this is surely a, a warning sign for his own campaign that he's going on. Well, McMullen has run an extraordinary campaign. I mean, you've got to give him a mm -hmm. ton of credit here. This has been a smart campaign the entire she way. She heard Jessica's Very comment impressed. there. She said, she goes, I'm not as convinced that he won't, he couldn't be wooed by Schumer if they needed the vote. Yeah. If you're McMullen, do you need to shut that down? Yeah. Actually, because yeah. I think probably, <laughs> probably no, now. I think yes. Yes. Honestly, I mean, yeah. that, I mean, sure, he's made it clear what he's going to do, which yeah. is not caucus with either either one. Yeah. And and to your point, doing math in public, yeah. it doesn't matter this go around if yeah. we walk in with 50, right? And he's one, and there's 49. Yeah. So, all right, okay. Nicholas, uh, Stephen, and Stephanie, thank you. Thank you for humoring me on Utah. Sorry. The story, as I, as I like to say in one of my old favorite movies, Fletch, the story is Utah, Steve. The story is Utah. <laughs> you can catch even more of our breakdown of November's key races on today's episode of the Chuck Toddcast. Stephen Hayes and Adrian Elrod are, were my guests for that. Get it wherever you get your podcasts. Up next, we're live in Ukraine, where Russia's army may be pushed to the brink as Putin continues to threaten nuclear consequences. Moments ago, the United Nations General Assembly voted on a resolution condemning Russia's annexation of four Ukrainian regions. Just five countries voted against that resolution. Russia, of course, Belarus, North Korea, Nicaragua, and Syria. Thirty-five others abstained, including China and India and a whole lot of countries in Africa, if you're keeping score there. And at a gathering of NATO defense ministers, two days after Russia's deadly bombardment, of multiple Ukrainian cities, NATO Secretary General said providing Ukraine with additional air defense is now a top priority. And despite continued condemnation, Russia carried out more missile strikes today, targeting Zaporizhia and other cities in southern Ukraine, raising questions about how long Russia will sustain these air attacks and where Putin goes from here. Meanwhile, Russia's FSB says that uh, have made that they've made eight arrests, including uh, five Russian citizens and three citizens of Ukraine and Armenia, in connection with the bridge explosion in Crimea. Russia's intelligence service claims the explosion was organized by Ukraine's chief of defense intelligence. Despite praising the attack, Ukraine has not taken responsibility technically for the blast. I'm joined now by none other than Richard Engel, who's on the ground in Ukraine. And Richard, you and I were speaking earlier today, and you, we're in this precarious situation where the more successful Ukraine is, uh, the more problems that Russia has with its military, the more dangerous this situation gets. Explain. Well, if Russia's conventional army is broken, and so far it seems like the conventional army is not working because Russia's had to issue a partial draft. It is effectively gang-pressing people into service, knocking on doors, in some cases sending conscripts right into battle. Uh, I spoke to a senior military official here who said that... The day after the draft was announced in Russia, some conscripts started showing up on the battlefield, meaning they had no extra training. And wow. Ukrainians say for them, that's a positive mm -hmm. because they are sending people here who are in some cases, to, to quote this official, drunks, alcoholics, looters who have no training. And he said they're easier to fight against, easier to kill than a well-trained, well-equipped army. But the more the conventional force breaks, the more that Vladimir Putin uh, is tempted to resort to his unconventional force, uh, which, as far as we understand, is still, is still very capable and still very numerous. So uh, if one force does, isn't working, mm -hmm. he may resort to the other. And, uh, and, th and that is really the danger. And the other danger is these small nuclear weapons. Uh, we're talking about tactical nuclear weapons. And going back, uh, Chuck, you, I know you're a student of history, going back to the days of the, the, the Cold War, 
there was always a concern about these small mm -hmm. nuclear weapons because they're easier to use. They're, they're, they're mm -hmm. possible to use in a battlefield scenario, unlike giant uh, thermonuclear devices that can destroy entire cities or more. Uh, yeah. These small tactical nukes are designed to be used against troop formations, lowering yeah. the bar for their potential use. And that has, has what uh, so many officials in this country and in, in, in other NATO countries are very yeah. concerned. Richard, what did your Ukrainian sources think of the president calling Putin a rational actor? And frankly, what that usually is code for is he's not going to be so stupid as to use a nuke. He didn't say it that way, but clearly the phrase rational actor is what he's trying to convey there. Perhaps Biden thinks that the, the message that NATO and America has sent has been received. How did Ukrainians hear that? So Ukrainians believe he is rational in that he is he's pursuing an, uh, an objective and he's using the tools uh, that that he has he's using his army uh, but they believe he's an angry actor that he's an un, uh, uncontrollable actor that he is not necessarily bound by what we would c consider rational behavior that why he, he might not be insane that mm -hmm. he's being driven by a passion for uh, imperialism he's driven by a sense of revenge because ukraine broke away from russia's sphere of influence in 2014 uh, so they they share the assessment uh, with the united states that russia hasn't taken any steps to mobilize weapons and u.s intelligence officials say that they're not seeing any indication that uh, these weapons are being moved or readied for use or that the, 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 the military apparatus in, in, um, in Russia has taken any concrete steps. No. It's, the, it's the analysis that is slightly different. Uh, they think that it is possible. And President Zelensky, speaking to the BBC recently, yeah. just said that, uh, th that uh, Putin is preparing the public, laying the groundwork, laying the ideological foundation for potential potentially using a tactical nuclear weapon, one of these small bombs. Well, it, he's, he's absolutely right. It's a fact. I mean, we heard Putin try to basically say the United States started this by using nuclear weapons in World War II. Anyway, Richard Engel on the ground force in Ukraine um, with some tremendous reporting. Richard, as always, thank you, and please stay safe. Now, uh, I want to get the reaction from a military perspective here. I'm joined now by retired Lieutenant General Steph Twitty, former Deputy Commander of U.S. European Command and an NBC News military analyst. You know, General, I, I want to start with the president calling Putin a rational actor uh, and the message he was intending to send by using that phrase. What did you hear? Yes, I heard what you said, uh, heard calling him a rational uh, actor. But here's what I will tell you, Chuck. In the great scheme of things, it doesn't matter whether he's rational or irrational. From a military perspective, and I have 40 years in the military, the military is always going to plan for the worst case. Expect the unexpected. And when we look at Russia, based on the saber rallying that he's done over the past couple of months, we have to expect the unexpected. So therefore, we have to plan for the unexpected. And I can guarantee you in the Pentagon, as well mm -hmm. as NATO and in the administration, that's what they're doing. They're planning for the unexpected in the event that President Putin decides to use, whether it's chemical weapons, tactical weapons, and all-out nuclear weapons, what are those options? It may be military options, diplomatic, information, economic options, but what are those right. options and levers that the president and the secretary general will have at their disposal? Well, General, let me ask you this. Uh, Jake Sullivan used a phrase with me two weeks ago. They know that... There'd be, catastrophic, there'd be a catastrophic reaction if they used a nuke, uh, essentially. They know that the consequences would be catastrophic. They, and they, he specifically used that word. What, what did you hear when you heard that word? What did that, what's that warning really mean to Russia? Yeah. Well, I heard the same thing. If you're thinking that the U.S. would use nuclear weapons in kind, I don't see that happening. I don't see us using nuclear weapons to, to attack Putin because he used a nuclear weapon. What I do see as a, a viable option is to use conventional weapons. And the mass and the amount of firepower, not only the U.S., but 30, now soon to be 32 countries, to bring 
against Russia if we had to do something would, would just, in my mind, would devastate the already broken Russian military. Let me ask you this. What can be done preemptively for Ukraine? If, if he has decided he wants to, to, to use a tactical nuke, is there anything we can do preemptively to help them? Yes, yeah, so there's a couple options. You hear President Zelensky, he's asking for essentially an air defense umbrella. And so it's very important that we focus on air defense for his country. As you can see that the Russians are able to strike from the Black Sea, they're able to strike from Russia proper. In many cases, the Ukrainians do not know whether those missiles or rockets are coming in because they're pretty far away. So we got to get radars in there. We have to build uh, more Stinger uh, air defense systems in there. We got to help them with their ammunition in terms of the S-300 air defense system that they have. The uh, Germans have pledged uh, air defense system that's pretty good air defense system called the IRST. Mm -hmm. We got to get that in there and get that umbrella up to be able to pr protect most of the critical infrastructure, but to also be able to give indicators and warnings of different yeah. missiles and rockets that the Russians are firing. I, General, it seems pretty obvious to me that the biggest mistake Putin could make would be trying to use a tactical nuke. He's not this unintelligent, is he? I don't think he is, and you're correct. That would be the biggest mistake. He's already isolated. His country is already isolated. He goes into further isolation. And he stands a chance for the U.S. and NATO mm -hmm. to strike back at him. And, and there's just so many uh, disadvantages for him and his country to go this route. Yeah. Uh, condemnation from across the world would occur. And so I just don't see this happening, although I have been wrong in the past. We'll see, but we do have to plan for the unexpected when it yeah. comes to Russia. We don't want you to be wrong about this, General. Anyway, <laughs> General Twitty, always good to get your expertise on this program, so thank you. Still to come, members of the Cherokee Nation are pushing Congress to live up to an obligation that this country made to the Cherokee Nation nearly 200 years ago. It was for a seat in Congress. I'm going to speak to the delegate hoping to make history, Kimberly Teehee, next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. The Cherokee Nation is calling on the United States government to make good on a nearly 200-year-old promise. That's right, 200 years, invoking their ability to send a delegate to Congress. This delegate agreement was part of the 1835 treaty that forced thousands of Cherokee off their lands, but later became known as the Trail of Tears. In exchange, the Cherokee Nation would receive money and a delegate in Congress. A quarter of the Cherokee died during that move, and the U.S. never fulfilled the promise of a voice in government. Former Obama administrative, administration advisor Kim Teehee was nominated as delegate back in 2019. But that process was delayed by COVID. Now the nation is redoubling their efforts. Cherokee Nation Principal Chief Chuck Hoskins wrote in an op-ed last month, quote, We have waited nearly 200 years for the United States to uphold the commitments it made in the Treaty of New Ishoda. It was essential to our ancestors to negotiate this right. And as the calendar year winds down and the midterm elections approach, it's critical that the House not wait a single day longer. So I'm joined now by Kim Teehee, the delegate designate for the Cherokee Nation. She's also uh, the nation's director of government relations. Uh, Madam Delegate, let me start with this. I, I, I'm really sort of uh, frustrated here watching this story because it seems as if there's largely agreement that this should be upheld, that this should happen. There seems to be bipartisan efforts to make this happen, and yet it's not happened. What is the impediment? What are the hurdles here? Is it bureaucratic? Is it just a lack of effort? What is it? I think part of the delay has been uh, sort of the unknown. How do we seat a delegate that is authorized by treaty that is the supreme law of the land? The process is actually quite simple. The House Rules Committee has jurisdiction. We've asked for a hearing in the House Rules. We've also asked for a vote this year. We've waited 200 years. It's, it's time. If you do get seated as a delegate, is it, this, is it the equivalent of D.C.'s delegate, the same kind of voting power, or is it something different? We're asking for 
the Cherokee Nation delegate to be treated similar to U.S. territory delegates mm -hmm. that, you know, and the distinction being that you don't have a vote on final passage on the floor, but you do have the ability to sit in committee, to vote in committee, to introduce legislation. Mm -hmm. We believe that the Cherokee Nation delegates should have the same kinds of authorities that delegates of U.S. territories receive, because as I mentioned earlier, and as mm -hmm. you well stated too, the law created Cherokee Nation's delegate, just like a law created U.S. territory delegates. Do you anticipate that this is something that can get done essentially in what is referred to around here as the lame duck session, the <laughs> post-election before the new Congress comes in, that this promise gets fulfilled? Absolutely. I think the stars are aligned in our favor. You know, it's it's coming down to the end of the year, but we're prepared to move full force. Let's keep in mind, too, you know, November would be a wonderful time to get the delegates seated, right? It is, after all, Native American Heritage Month. And so we're asking for a hearing. We're asking for a vote straight up and down. Only the House has to vote. The Senate doesn't have to. Keep yeah. in mind, because our removal treaty was ratified by the Senate and and signed by the president of the United States, albeit almost 200 years ago, but it is still the supreme law of the land. Other than inertia, wh wh what is the argument against this? I don't have an argument against it. You know, I don't want to, I don't no, want to I'm not trying to, but I, know, has anybody, out there. <laughs> all right, let me put it this way. Are, are you, is there an opposition in Congress to this or is it just simply not getting it on the agenda that this needs to be, that this is on Pelosi and Hoyer? Right. I think that, you know, we waited for a very long time to get some questions asked and answered. Mm -hmm. We've gone back to the Federalist Papers to <laughs> uh, to to go back and to talk about the delegate. Mm -hmm. I'm appointed, not elected. Well, guess what? The early republic, you know, the House was filled right. with uh, delegates who were appointed. Right. So we know that is a permissible way of of uh, making a selection for who represents that nation. You know, we you know, double representation. No, it's not dual, dual representation because delegates don't get votes on the final passage right. of bills, right? We know that this no equal protection issues either. Because right. why? Because we know that a treaty is a contract between two sovereigns. And because of that, you know, there are specific commitments between the two sovereigns that must be fulfilled. And in this case, you know, we're asking the United States to fulfill uh, its part of the bargain. All right. If you get this seat in Congress uh, and, and get on some committees, what is the committee you want on, number one? And what's your first What's the first thing you'd like to see, Bill, you'd like to shape that could be beneficial to the Cherokee Nation? Well, obviously appropriations, right? There, mm -hmm. we, you know, we've <laughs> we've highlighted probably no more than the pandemic has highlighted uh, the lack of resources to Indian country and the great needs and the gaps that still exist. So, getting the appropriate resources mm -hmm. deployed out to Cherokee Nation, but also uh, the rest of Indian country too. But in addition to that, addressing healthcare access, connectivity, yep. housing, you know, infrastructure, public safety, those yep. are all huge hugely important to us. And so no. taking on those things, but I don't want to forget fundamentally who we are either, Chuck, which is Cherokee Nation, which yep. is also taking efforts to protect our language. We have massive yep. revitaliz revitalization efforts underway, and we certainly want to make sure that we uh, get the resources necessary in order to preserve our language. Well, let's see us fulfill our treaty commitments. Delegate designate Kim Teehee, really appreciate you coming on, explaining this situation and making our viewers a little smarter about all of this. And thank you all for being with us this hour. I'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.